Hello, and welcome to our uh, next lecture in the Neuroscience of Memory from my Cognitive Neuroscience course. In the previous uh, lecture, we talked a little bit about the uh, anatomical features associated with memory and some, dove into some specifics about uh, episodic memory versus semantic memory, etc. I want to now get into some neural imaging studies, and this is principally... Um, studies of um, episodic memory. So that's where we'll be spending most of our time, but some interesting um, work about the hippocampus uh, and frontal and parietal lobes. So here's the uh, sort of agenda for this lecture. We're going to first talk about what we call the subsequent memory paradigm. And I introduced this, I believe, uh, very early on in the series um, in discussing methodology for cognitive neuroscience. Uh, but we'll talk about that again. Then I want to introduce some uh, concepts in recollection and recognition memory. I uh, talk about the cognitive um, procedures as well as the neuroscience uh, results. Talk about episodic memory in the hippocampus. Then we'll focus on the frontal lobes and encoding and retrieval. And then finally, we're, we'll finish with retrieval on the pro actually, no. <laughs> I believe it's encoding and retrieval um, across both the frontal and the parietal cortex. I didn't fix this slide, but we'll worry about that when we get to it. Um, let's get to, into the subsequent memory paradigm. So this particular kind of study uses uh, what we call event-related functional magnetic resonance imaging, um, which is a uh, particular methodology in which we can get a pretty good trial-by-trial um, -trial set of data uh, for um, fMRI uh, research. Uh, um, the technology associated with magnetic resonance imaging has um, come leaps and bounds since uh, when I was in graduate school. And so we can scan specific areas uh, very quickly. Uh, we can use some uh, computer manipulation to look at uh, the time course of the signal change uh, by, you know, uh, seconds, I would say. And so in this particular paradigm, what they do is they scan uh, the individuals both during encoding and retrieval. And then what they're able to do is look at the scans for items that they successfully retrieved at both encoding and retrieval. So if they saw the word cricket during encoding and in the retrieval phase they successfully remembered cricket, they can go back and look at the scan for the word cricket during encoding and say, here's how encoding was different for successfully remembered items versus not successfully remembered items. And so that's what we call this subsequent memory paradigm. So events are analyzed according to whether they were successfully remembered later or not. And what we see in these particular um, studies is the left inferior prefrontal cortex and the left medial temporal lobe are associated with successful encoding. So if you look at the top of this figure, we see the left inferior prefrontal cortex. Uh, we start seeing um, some specific areas, and this inferior prefrontal cortex is going to come up a lot uh, in uh, neural imaging studies of uh, memory. So that's uh, kind of a sagittal uh, view of the um, medial side, sorry, of the lateral side of the uh, prefrontal cortex on the left side. Uh, then if we look in the left medial temporal lobe, uh, we also see, um, and this looks to me uh, to be sort of the edge of a coronal slice. It took me a while to figure it out. Uh, I had to sit and stare at it for a while. <laughs> um, and uh, what you can see is pretty significant change in uh, the medial temporal lobes as well. So this would be right along, sort of right, right at that uh, hippocampal gyrus type of area. Um, so the left inferior prefrontal cortex and left medial temporal lobe are associated with successful memory encoding. And so these are obviously important areas for memory encoding. Now I want to talk a little bit about recollection versus familiarity. And this has come up in a few areas as we've been discussing memory. So the idea about recollection versus familiarity, and I think I introduced this when we started talking about implicit versus explicit memory, is uh, recollective experiences are those in which we have very specific spatial temporal context associated with our memories. That is, we can specifically remember sort of when and where we remember something. Versus familiarity is when something seems familiar, but we don't have a specific memory associated with it. And the example I always use is you might see somebody um, out and about you know, when we used to be able to go out and about. Um, and you might see somebody and say, I know that person. They were in my intro psych class. Um, they sat in this part of the um, classroom. 
etc. Um, or you might see your psych professor and say, oh, there's my intro psych professor. Um, so that's a recollective experience um, where you know exactly where and when you might know somebody from versus familiarity is, God, that person looks really familiar, but I cannot for the life of me remember where I know them from. So you have that familiarity response that is you know there's a memory there, um, but you can't identify it. And the same thing happens with um, memory studies. So we have people during the retrieval phase say, yes, I specifically remember this item. Here's my confidence in that. Um, or this seems, I think it was there. I'm not sure. And so oftentimes we do um, recollection familiarity or a guess. So yes, I guess that I'm guessing that might be there. Um, this is also sometimes used in a remember no procedure. They're very similar, but really we focus on recollection versus familiarity. Um, and so those, those are some of the procedures we use in some of the examples. Now, the Gazanaga textbook I use for this course um, does not do a very good job of delineating a recollection versus familiarity experiment with a source memory experiment. And we're going to talk about source memory here in just a moment. But let's take a look at these fMRI results. So these are uh, results associated with a recollection response. So we see correct re recollection, correct familiarity, correct rejection, and misses. And you can, only, you can see that um, we get left and right uh, hippocampal um, increased responses for um, correct recollection responses. You see we get kind of a late um, hippocampal, particularly on the right side, um, response for familiarity responses. And um, my belief about that is it's probably because that's associated with, this is probably a visual, these items are probably represented visually, and we're gonna talk, we'll look at uh, sensory specific memory here in just a moment. Um, and so they're probably trying to picture whether or not they saw that particular item, and we see that quite a bit. So we also see that familiarity-based recognition is associated with um, pararhinal cortex. Um, so these are familiarity responses where they aren't recollecting the experience. We see a little bit more parahrhinal cortex involvement as our confidence in that familiarity response increases. Uh, we also see some, obviously, uh, prefrontal um, and somatosensory, other uh, sensory cortices as well. But you can see if you look at the coronal slice here on the top left of this figure, um, we see temporal lobes and a little mid-sagittal um, action as well. So, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is source memory. And so, uh, one of the things that, uh, again, the textbook I'm using, and this is where this figure comes from, doesn't use, um, do very well, is talk about what we call source memory. And accurate source memory is where you accurately identify the source of a memory. So you can make what's called a source monitoring error in which you have incorrectly identified the source of a memory. So uh, uh, examples might be, you s we're back to the person you see when you're out and about, and you identify them as having been in your intro site class when in actuality there's somebody who lives in your dorm. Okay, uh, You have inaccurately identified or misattributed the source of that memory. Um, and this happens all the time. A um, more sort of simple example is you might attribute um, a news item um, to the wrong source. So uh, there's some really interesting studies about uh, trying to dispel myths about the flu vaccine. And uh, the study that was attempting to dispel myths about the flu vaccine um, had a source recognition problem because what happened is um, while they were unsuccessful in um, getting rid of people's beliefs about the myths uh, about the flu vaccine, they were successful in making people believe that the myths came from the CDC. So the source went from being, oh, my friends tell me this is the myth about the flu vaccine to the CDC says this is the myth about the flu vaccine, and they believe it. They don't believe it's a myth. They believe it's true. And so that's a source monitoring error. So accurate source memory, and in this particular study, they put things in red versus green, very common way about doing these things. Um, accurate source memory occurs when they correctly identify that an item was presented in red or green. So we see um, hippocampal and posterior hippocampal cortex, as well as some frontal lobe activity associated with this accurate source memory. So if we take a look at this, these are accurate um, source memory responses, um, what the text is calling recollection responses. Those are kind of technically correct, but this is a source judgment. Uh, and the source judgment is um, 
a separate task on its own, which is probably where some of this frontal lobe activity is coming from. But you can see the posterior parahippocampal uh, and fusiform gyrus and the posterior hippocampus are both pretty clearly involved in this kind of source memory response. So that then gets us to um, episodic memory in the hippocampus. Um, there are inputs from both the what and the where pathways that we've talked about in previous lectures. Uh, so the what pathway is, of course, the um, part of the brain responsible for telling us what things are. The where pathway tells us where they are. So we see the what pathway coming in from unimodal association areas into the um, parahippocampal cortex and the anterior parahippocampal complex or parahippocampal cortex. Uh, the wear pathway coming through multimodal multi association areas and coming into the posterior parahippocampal cortex. These go into the anterior cortex um, and then into the hippocampal formation. So these are sort of the direct inputs. So the binding of uh, items and context model uh, proposes that parahippocampal cortex represents item specific information, whereas the parahippocampal cortex represents contextual information. So the parahippocampal cortex is getting us item-specific information, the word itself, for example, in the previous study we talked about, whereas the parahippocampal cortex is going to represent that contextual information, what color it was, that it was presented a few minutes ago, and um, not, uh, you know that sort of thing. So as a result, uh, the parahippocampal cortex is sufficient for familiarity because it identifies the item but not the specific context. And that's an important part of understanding the overall way in which the brain is associating memory. So that gets us then to relational memory. This is sort of memory which relates different components of memory to one another. Um, so this is how we're kind of combining or relating information in a memory together. So you remember seeing a name and a face or a face and a place, a name and a face and a place. Um, and so in this study, you see on the right, what they've done is they've looked at um, adding and subtracting people from um, views for college age controls, controls, and amnesic patients. Um, and what you can see is the amnesic patients are a little bit less uh, aware of uh, the removal of that binding of the faces and places, that is, they don't notice that they're missing, whereas the non amnesic patients did. Uh, so we see hippocampal damage is, re is reducing that relational memory. It's not binding context, items and context together. Um, so that's an important thing to think about. Next thing on encoding and retrieval is memory retrieval does appear to be modality specific. Uh, Wheeler and colleagues uh, show in this um, fMRI study you see on the right um, that visual recognition and auditory recognition areas are both active during retrieval of visual and auditory memories. Um, so you can see the upper um, figures where you see green. Uh, those are um, remembering visually presented material, whereas on the bottom we see um, a retrieval of auditory material. Sorry. So on the left is perception. On the right is the retrieval. And you can see there's some overlap in those areas. In particular, you can see up on the upper figure we see uh, right visual left visual spatial or sorry, visual areas um, bilateral in the middle um, slice there um, occipital lobe visual perception areas then at the bottom when we see in the auditory uh, we see almost entirely left auditory cortex so probably linguistic uh, access there um, I, one of the interesting things about this um, while my dissertation kind of uh, wasn't all that well received. I wasn't able to actually get it published. Um, at the time, we just didn't have the best ERP equipment. Uh, the data do actually support uh, this same finding. And this is going to bridge us to um, some of the next discussions about fault, true and false recognition. So in my doctoral dissertation, what we did is um, we had items that were presented either um, visually, that is, they saw them on the screen, or uh, they heard them. And they heard my voice. <laughs> I had to record every single word for that study. Um, and this was using what we call the Dees, Rode, Dees, Rodiger, and McDermott paradigm, or sometimes people call it the dream paradigm. And what happens in the Dees, Rodiger, and McDermott paradigm is you present lists of related words. Um, and so, for example, a bunch of words are presented that are related to the word needle. So pin, prick, um, injection, um, syringe, hypodermic, um, I can't remember all of them, um, but they're all associated, associated with the word needle. The word needle is never presented. 
And so that would be what we call the lure item. Uh, what happens in these um, particular studies is people falsely remember having heard or seen the word that was not presented or that lure item. And so what we did is a between subjects manipulation in which half participants saw items, half participants heard items, and then we track the event related potentials uh, when they go to try to determine whether or not an item uh, was presented earlier. And what we see here are hits, that is they correctly identify an item as having been presented earlier, and false alarms, that is they identify an item as having been presented when it actually wasn't. Uh, what you can see straight off is the blue versus red lines, that the event-related potential components are very different when they're trying to remember a um, auditory versus uh, visual item. And there is some separation in a few areas between uh, false alarms and uh, correct identification of previously presented items. Uh, this dovetails nicely uh, with some fMRI studies showing greater hippocampal activity for um, true versus uh, false alarms. Uh, so you can see the hippocampal and visual areas. This is in a visual study. Um, uh, that the hippocampus is more involved than if you look at um, false alarms versus true items. That is the areas that uh, were much more likely to be active for false alarms. Uh, we see medial superior prefrontal cortex and inferior parietal cortex. So these are probably some decision areas where they're trying to decide whether or not it's a true or false item. Um, and uh, some of those same areas associated with things like source memory. So that gets us to the frontal parietal cortex. Um, we'll start with hemif <laughs> the HERA model, which stands for Hemispheric Encoding Retrieval Asymmetry. Uh, early studies of functional magnetic resonance imaging indicated a hemispheric encoding retrieval asymmetry, which you can see here on the right. That is, the left hemisphere was more associated with encoding, and the right hemisphere was more associated with retrieval, in particular, uh, the frontal um, prefrontal cortex, what we call the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, I, I'm not convinced this entire controversy has been put to rest, um, but there are some other data to show on visual versus verbal material. So some studies have shown that the right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is what the DLPFC is, that right DLPFC activation for encoding of both verbal and nonverbal material occurs, but we get l increased, uh, sorry, we only get left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex activation for verbal material. But um, when we do retrieval, so during encoding, we get right DLPFC activation for encoding of verbal and nonverbal material. So this is not working well with the HERA model. Um, the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex activation occurs only for verbal material, whereas retrieval of mater verbal material is only left hemisphere and nonverbal material. Um, associated with the right dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Some of the differences in all of these studies have to do whether or not the nonverbal material, um, the visual material, was nameable, like a nameable object. Because once you're naming an object, you're back to accessing verbal material. And so I'm not hanging my hat on either of these models, particularly as being exactly correct. I think there is some very clear associations with visual material in the right hemisphere, verbal material in the left hemisphere. It's consistent with everything else we know about uh, the brain. And so trying to figure out all of this uh, is it's kind of weirdly enough still trying to wash out. That gets us into some memory guided behaviors. And this is going to tie in with um, decision making, which we'll get to um, here uh, in a few lectures. So uh, memory intersects with a variety of processes, including perception, attention, and decision making. So we know that um, we get top-down processing in uh, visual recognition. And so our memory is actually helping to drive perception. And so um, that's, some of that's probably happening here in this posterior um, medial network, um, this sort of what we call default network. But we also get um, lateral orbital frontal cortex, amygdala, ventral temporal cortex, or the anterior temporal cortex. This may be intersecting with uh, some of the attention systems. So the default network might be being associated with um, visual attention, for example, whereas executive attention, executive functionings are probably involved in this anterior system, and those are intersecting with longer-term memory as we start to make things like decisions.
So that gets us then to uh, the end of this particular lecture. The next lecture, we're going to be talking about memory consolidation, um, basically trying to take a look at the underlying processes involved in taking your memories and making them permanent.